All right, turn to John chapter 4. Not chapter 4, I don't know why I said that. Turn to chapter 12. <laughs> Let me just quickly turn this on real quick. Sorry, I should have done this before. I think you can start over so it can record the whole thing. No, nope, that's it. No, people who listen won't get me saying John chapter 4. You say John chapter 4? No, it's John chapter 12. Yeah, I like to confuse people. That's the best way to teach. Yeah, John chapter 12. And it's a good one this morning. We're in for a treat. Because we're moving out of the book of the signs that we've been in for so long. We're now moving as we come, we saw Lazarus was kind of the last sign before the ultimate sign of Jesus' own resurrection. But we're out of the book of the signs and we're moving into the book of glory. And we'll see that uh, this morning. And we have basically kind of three episodes that we're going to look at today. Three scenes which kind of lead up to the turning point. Uh, where Jesus acknowledges that his hour has come and he sort of, and that you can see that the momentum of the narrative is moving towards his death and his resurrection, his glorification that he speaks of so many times. So we have, we'll have three events, two kind of foreshadow that uh, his death and resurrection and it's kind of deep uh, theological significance to some of those things that happen uh, beyond just the historical events themselves. Uh, and then we'll look at one event that is the trigger that kind of makes Jesus announce to everyone that now his hour has come. So let's begin uh, with the verses 1 to 11 of John chapter 12. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at table. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of uh, his disciples, he was about to betray him, said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. When a large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came, not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. So here we are. This is the anointing at Bethany. Uh, and it begins by giving us a time. Uh, it's six days before the Passover. So this is John kind of uh, using the Passover to build momentum. We're already looking forward. It's six days before the Passover. We're coming up to this, the great celebration of the Jewish year, the high point, if you like, of their Um, redemptive memory, history recollection, (laughs) remembering that great redemptive act that uh, that, uh, God did bringing them out of Egypt. So John is kind of using that to build the momentum. Uh, Think of um, uh, like a Christmas film, you know, like Christmas movies often have like a countdown to Christmas and it's a way to get the, to build the tension in the narrative as you get towards an event that you already know is exciting. So that the, uh, the great resolution in a rom-com, like a Christmas rom-com, the couple will come together on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day. There's a similar sort of things happening here. Six days before Passover, the momentum is, is building. Things are beginning to happen. You kind of get the, the impression that something is coming. And this uh, story is told in a couple of other places in the New Testament as well, this anointing at Bethany. Uh, Matthew and Mark both tell the same story with a couple of different uh, uh, elements emphasized in their narrative um, but it's the same it's the same thing that's happening um, and Luke uh, records a, a similar event but the details are different enough that it's probably referring to a different time that Jesus was uh, anointed in, in Luke 7 36 to 50. Here John 
is retelling this anointing at Bethany and he's bringing out a couple of things that he wants us to see that are different to the Matthew and Mark account. Uh, and by bringing out these elements, he's kind of highlighting the extravagance of uh, Mary's offering, the depth of her devotion to Jesus and some of the deeper significance of what she's doing. So let's, we'll have a look at some of those things. Firstly, the extravagance of the offering. That's made very explicit and clear in the, in the text, isn't it? A denarii was about a day's wage uh, for an average kind of labourer. So 300 denarii that Judas assesses that it's probably worth this, this nard that she anoints Jesus with is about a year's wage when you kind of calculate that you don't get paid for on a Sabbath. <laughs> so it's about a year's wages that she's using to anoint Jesus with um, here. Uh, so it's an extravagant gift. We don't, know, we don't know the kind of socioeconomic status of these people, but even if they were kind of well-off people, this is still a significant uh, thing that she's giving up and serving Jesus with and honouring Jesus with. So the obvious kind of first kind of application kind of writes itself on that. She is using this expensive gift to anoint Jesus. It's kind of beyond what you would expect someone to anoint someone with. It's, uh, it's expensive, it's precious, it's potentially a family heirloom, perhaps. This is the sort of thing that families might pass on from one generation to another, no, never really expecting to use it. It's something that you have. And she's pouring it out on Jesus' feet. So the question for us, what are we willing to devote to Jesus? She gives him what we, ex we kind of expect is the, her most precious item that she has. We are to give Jesus our most precious things that we have in our life, our best, as in it, the first fruits that we often uh, hear it put that way. But there's more to, more to it than just uh, the extravagance. Uh, John is concerned to bring out the fact that it's Judas that notices it, notices the extravagance of this, uh, this uh, act that she does. Uh, Matthew and Mark both just say the disciples were kind of annoyed at the cost of this nard, and they would say, why, did, why, didn't, why didn't we sell it and give it the money to the poor? But John brings out that it's actually Judas is responsible for that observation. And Judas uh, is mentioned more times in John than he is in any of the other Gospels. And I think that John is concerned to bring out kind of Judas's personal responsibility. It gives us a little hint of his character here. That, uh, that you're not to think of Judas as kind of an innocent sort of, you know, he made one mistake, but really he's a character that uh, is responsible for his actions um, as the betrayer. John wants to bring that out. Uh, he mentions John, uh, Judas eight times, much more than uh, in any of the other Gospels. And we know that he wasn't actually bothered about the poor. He kind of pretends, isn't he? He's like, why wasn't this sold to the poor? But really, he was, uh, he was looking to get something out of it because he was a thief. Uh, we can say that his criticism or his kind of question is motivated by self-interest. He's kind of making demands and making accusations for what he can get out of it. It's kind of like he's attempting to sound pious for his own advantage. Or you could say he's masking self-interest with false concern or care. And I think that's a, a challenge for us, isn't it? Um, it's, easy, uh, it's easy to kind of look at like a politician cynically and be like a politician like serves with the poor or does something like a soup kitchen or something and he's obviously not doing it for the, the people he's serving, he's doing it for the votes or the, the whatever image he can create out of that and, and it, it's easy to be very cynical about that but we do the same thing I'm sure, I'm sure. Do we actually serve here in, on a Sunday morning or serve in other capacities or do we perform devotional acts out of a sense of devotion, a sense of honouring Christ, a sense of love for him and service for him or is it to gain status to gain influence or just for the fun of it or the friends that we have the other ulterior motives that are self-serving or self-interested do we want to present that we're a great christian that cares about xyz or serves in various ways but actually inside we're dead inside that's a, that's a challenge for us this morning we don't want to be <laughs> caught in the trap that judas falls into there 
But then Jesus says something interesting in response to Judas. Uh, the poor, he has this phrase, the poor you will always have with you. Uh, which is kind of a, a funny phrase. I remember hearing um, uh, kind of as a public commentator in England who's a, who's a very liberal uh, Church of England vicar, uh, kind of like on the very left of the political spectrum. And he, he, I remember him saying so like angrily, like he said, I hate this verse, like because, the, because it implies that the poor, that you'll never be able to eradicate poverty. And as a, it's kind of an interesting comment for, for many reasons, but it's, it's not really about that. Jesus is a, that's not really the main point. That's an implication of it, but really, he's not talking about the kind of essential nature of poverty or the kind of the never-ending cycles of oppression and hierarchy that we have to live in in this world. That's not really his main point. The point is priorities, isn't it? He's basically saying, what are your priorities? I am here and it's better to serve me. It would have been fine, presumably it would have been fine to sell that uh, nard and give the proceeds to the poor. It's not that that would be a bad thing, uh, but uh, it's better to serve Christ and honor him in this way whilst he is there. So it's about priorities. What are our priorities? You know, are we more concerned about the kind of the here and now as we serve people? Or are we more concerned about the hereafter and the spiritual realities as we serve people and Christ obviously so the other thing that I think that John wants to bring out is the depth of Mary's devotion here um, because John specifically mentions his feet she anoints his feet whereas in Matthew and Mark uh, the, they, they, they both talk about him anointing his head so why, why, why did he change it or why does he emphasize one part of the anointing rather than the other well, just you know what's going to come, right? I'm sure you all know that the next couple of chapters, or the next chapter, Jesus is going to uh, wash his disciples' feet as kind of the ultimate example of how to be a servant kind of leader or serve others. So here, with her anointing his feet, is a little kind of foreshadowing of what's about to happen. And it highlights her devotion, her service to Jesus. To wash someone's feet is the kind of lowest act of service for someone. And not just to wash them with water, but to, with this oil. And then with the hair, it's a very personal, intimate kind of act that she's doing here, where she anoints and then washes the oil with her hair. And it's in direct contrast to the kind of response to Jesus that we've seen already with the Pharisees and the, and the teachers of the law and the, high, and the priests and things. They reject Jesus and then immediately after that, you have this story of, um, of Mary who give, gives this act of great devotion to Jesus. There's a contrast that we're supposed to see here. And then we're also told that there, in verse 3 that the house fills with the fragrance of this, uh, this nard that she pours. It's again, again, it's highlighting the extravagance, but it's also kind of a literary technique if you think about it, isn't it? It's kind of, as you read that, it pulls you into the scene and you can almost sort of feel yourself there, like over the, over the smells of food and the, the people and the night air and stuff. Like this nard is, is perfuming the room. You can almost smell it yourself. Uh, and that kind of literary technique highlights the gloriousness of what's happening here, I think. Poetically, John is saying what the other gospel writers put in the mouth of Jesus. Jesus says that wherever the gospel is preached, people will, uh, will talk about this lady, uh, what Mary's done, this act of devotion. And here, this is kind of a poetic way of saying the same thing. Wherever the gospel preaches, her act of love and devotion is kind of emanating. Uh, it's kind of having this effect. Um, Herman Ridderbos, a commentator, Dutch uh, theologian, <coughs> writes this about it. Never did the Son of God dwell more gloriously among humans than at that last banquet. And nowhere else was the response of their faith and love to his presence more vivid and eloquent. Mary's action expresses what she did not have the words to voice, but it filled the whole house with the fragrance of her love and as such would continue to spread through the preaching of the gospel in the whole world. I think that's an apt and good quote. So the practical implication of this for us is our lives are supposed to be a fragrant offering, aren't they? A fragrant offering uh, to, to Christ. 
What sort of smell do we fill the room with, we could ask ourselves. Is it the savour of Christ? Do we exude kind of uh, the graces of the Holy Spirit, if you like? Uh, is our acts of, do our acts of devotions have a kind of resonant quality um, that would be pleasing to the Father? There are questions we could ask ourselves and challenge ourselves with this morning. Uh, there's also a deeper significance to uh, what she does here when Jesus kind of highlights that when he says, leave her alone so that me, she may keep it for the day of my burial. Because this anointing is actually also a foreshadowing of Jesus' death, isn't it? Um, uh, she brings a pound of nard, and then later in John chapter 19, Nicodemus, when he takes the body uh, uh, off the tree and off the cross and anoints it, it says he brings a hundred pounds uh, of anointing oil, myrrh and aloes. So there's a foreshadowing here. This anointing is like a pre-death anointing. But also think about who, who, who is anointed or what's anointed in the Old Testament. Uh, kings were anointed, priests were anointed, but also the tabernacle uh, was anointed too uh, with oil. And, here, and uh, there's lots of lots of Oh, there's loads of allusions to uh, anointing throughout the, the Psalms and other places, talking about fragrant offerings and stuff. So here, lots of Old Testament themes are being drawn together. Jesus is the great high priest, isn't he? He is our king. Um, he is the fulfillment of the tabernacle, the presence of God, the temple. All these things are anointed. Uh, and all those things are anointed kind of before they do the thing that they're called to do. The priests are anointed before they minister. The king is anointed before he ascends his throne. Uh, and the tabernacle was anointed before the presence of God came and dwelt in it. And here Jesus is being anointed before his great redemptive act. He's being kind of set apart and, uh, well, symbolically the spirit is being uh, poured out on him before he does the thing that he come to do, to be our great king, to be the high priest. Uh, to fulfill the meaning of the temple, uh, but not in the sort of expected glorious way, but through a death. The anointing of death is going on here. His kingship and his priesthood is a, of a different order. And then uh, we just have this little bit in verse 9 to 11. After the event, um, John just has this little bit in verse 9 to 11 to kind of highlight the contrast between Mary's devotion to Jesus uh, and these, uh, these priests that are so against Jesus. They're so against him that they're willing to have Lazarus killed as well. Poor old Lazarus. He's been through enough, hasn't he? You know, they want him dead because they hate Jesus so much and people are going after Jesus because of Lazarus. Uh, let's get him out of the picture as well. But it also builds momentum for the next scene because... This crowd uh, that's at the, the, um, the feast that Jesus is at, they're going after Jesus, and that's going to be the crowd that follows uh, him, if you like, into the next scene, which is the triumphal entry. So let's, uh, let's read about the triumphal entry. Excuse me. Verse 12 to 16. Oh, sorry, 12 to 19. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written. Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went with him, or went to meet him, was that they heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, You see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. So this is one of uh, those events that's mentioned in all four Gospels. So it's a very important <laughs> event, obviously. Uh, but it's a very dramatic one, isn't it? It's very cinematic. You can imagine it. You can visualize it very easily. The crowd that was at the feast has come. 
to see Jesus enter Jerusalem triumphantly. There's a buzz, isn't there? There's a buzz about Jesus. People are excited about him and what he's doing. And this scene has a sort of climactic feel to it. This is kind of the epic moment before the final showdown. It's almost like one of those penultimate crescendos in a piece of music before the, before the end. It, the, the narrative is coming to a head here. But you would expect at this final showdown the king to come and then take up his throne. That is the final showdown. The final, final showdown that you're expecting is he comes into the city ascends his throne by triumphing over his enemies, you think. But ironically, we know, don't we, that uh, Jesus' enthronement takes place on a cross. His showdown looks a lot like uh, defeat. He's not going to overthrow the Romans. The Romans are actually going to nail his body to a piece of wood. But for now, the, uh, the people are shouting, Hosanna! Uh, which literally uh, translated, uh, according to D.A. Carson, means give salvation now. They're expecting salvation from Christ as he comes into the city, and they're saying, blessed, or blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, which is a direct quote from Psalm 118, 25, which is a messianic psalm. And this is a messianic phrase, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, is the Messiah. It's messianic language, but then they add this end bit to him, to the quote, even the king of Israel. So the Messiah is coming as Israel's king. And they don't even know, sort of, you get the impression that they don't even know how right they are. They're saying these things and perhaps meaning them in a slightly different way to how they're going to be fulfilled. It is messianic language, but they, mis they misunderstand. And we kind of know they misunderstand because they're waving palm branches. What's the significance of that? You might ask, well, by this time, palm branches had kind of become a nationalistic, that's a slightly anachronistic term, but a kind of a national symbol uh, of Judah. Um, it was a symbol used during the Maccabean revolt, uh, and people waved palm branches during and in celebration of that. So it had become kind of like a symbol of resistance, if you like, a resistance symbol. Um, kind of in the same way that a flag might be used today. Like if a bunch of people kind of got together and they were waving the Confederate flag, you would kind of know that they maybe weren't super happy with the government in Washington. Like they were waving that flag as opposed to the Stars and Stripes for a reason. Same sort of thing. They're waving the, the palm branches rather, rather than a Roman eagle. Something because they're expecting salvation in terms of an immediate messianic kingdom set up um, here, like in the here and now for them by overthrowing the Romans. But the context of Zechariah gives us a hint to what was really happening, and, then, and that's why John just kind of says that the disciples didn't really get it until he'd been glorified, and then they kind of fully got the significance of what was happening, and what was happening was exactly what Zechariah had prophesied. Uh, back in uh, Zechariah 9, verse 9 is where the little quotation is taken from. Um, and just a little bit about Zechariah, because when you see a quotation in the, Old, uh, in the New Testament, you want to go back to the Old Testament and look at the entire context of that quote. Zechariah is a post-exilic prophet, obviously. Uh, he's prophesying to the Jews that returned from exile, and they had come back from exile uh, and that, which was a kind of great moment of restoration for them. It was a, like a, a partial fulfillment of some of the promises that God had made to them, but only a partial fulfillment. So things weren't going necessarily as well as they would like. Israel was falling into some of the same sins, idolatries, and apathies um, that they had had before they were taken into exile. So Zechariah was there to encourage the people of Israel that actually that this restoration is not, this isn't it, guys. There's something greater coming. There's going to be a messianic kingdom that extends over the entire earth. That's kind of Zechariah's message in chapter 9 when he's talking about your king will come to you riding on a donkey. And he, there's a couple of things that Zechariah says that indicate more about what this rule is really going to be like because he comes humble. He comes humble riding on a donkey and he says the battle bow shall be cut off. He shall speak peace to the nations. See, Jesus' rule won't be extended through war and conquest or 
kind of political rebellion or resistance. It's a reign of peace that's going to begin with Jesus laying down his life in death. He's a humble king. Uh, and that just kind of, the kind of point about that is, Jesus doesn't meet our expectations. He didn't meet their expectations. They were kind of expecting him to come and immediately throw off the Romans and set up a new uh, kingdom of Israel, or at least Judah. And we know that story so well that we kind of think, oh, no, Jesus does meet our expectations because we know, we know what happens. We, we know it so well. But actually, we've got to, uh, we've got to challenge ourselves with that and not set up things that we expect Jesus will do for us. We don't want to fall into the trap of thinking Jesus is going to kind of roll back the tide of cultural change to the 1950s, or he's going to, he's going to necessarily make our children kind of good old southern boys and girls, or he's going to bless our kind of financial efforts at prudence and things like these are, maybe he will do some of those things maybe he won't he's come to save sinners he's come to establish his kingdom uh, and bring the elect in to worship him as his body as they're unified to him he has a different kind of set of priorities that we might want out of life And then this kind of bit about the triumphal entry uh, comes to a close with the, with the Pharisees and the, the Jews saying, kind of, see the whole world has gone after them, uh, after him. Uh, Jesus is gaining momentum and support at this point. And they kind of say more than they realize as well. They say the whole world has gone after him. It's kind of hyperbole, <laughs> hyperbole. But actually, the whole world is going after him, as we will see in the next. It's kind of leading into the next uh, little event. So let's read the next few verses. Verse 20 through to 26. Now, among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If everyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honour him. So there we have it. Uh, some, some Greeks kind of turn up and they want to see Jesus, don't they? Which is kind of like in direct fulfilment of what they were saying. The whole world has gone after him. Some Gentiles, some non-Jews are coming to see Jesus. And that's the trigger. That's the thing that makes Jesus switch kind of gear, if you like, and say that now my hour has come. We don't know a lot about these Greeks. This is the only time they're mentioned. They never turn up again. We don't even know their names. But they are worshipping at the feast, so they're probably God-fearers, but not necessarily kind of full Jews. And they come to Philip, most uh, likely because Philip is a Greek name, uh, and he comes from Bethsaida, which had a Greek population, so he probably spoke Greek, potentially. That's probably why they came to him first. Um, and then he goes to Andrew, and nobody knows why that's included. Nobody can really come up with a reason why he goes to Andrew, other than that's what happened. You know, John knew these guys, was there, and just remembers this historical detail. They go to Andrew, and then they go to Jesus. So the Gentiles are wanting to see Jesus. Jesus has said earlier, hasn't he, in uh, chapter 10, 16, that he has sheep that are not of his fold, and they hear his voice. These are the sheep that are not, uh, yeah, the sheep that are not of this fold, not of Israel, Gentiles. And again, it's in comparison to the the, the, pre, the priests and Pharisees have rejected Jesus. The Gentiles are accepting Jesus. They want to see Jesus. 
And that should be our great, greatest uh, desire, isn't it? Their phrase in the King James uh, is, we would see Christ. And I was listening to a sermon completely by chance this week by uh, James Montgomery Boyce from 10th Presbyterian, dead now, but old sermon. Uh, and he was saying that uh, he used to preach in a pulpit that had a little sign down in the pulpit that simply said, we would see Christ to remind whoever got into the pulpit that that is kind of the thing, that's the thing that his congregation needed, was to see Christ. Nothing else is of any real significance or matters anywhere near as much uh, as you think it might. Uh, these guys, these Greeks, have the right attitude, and that should be our attitude, shouldn't it? Uh, when we come on a Sunday morning, when we come to scriptures, when we spend time in prayer, we would see Christ. That is our greatest need. And it's uh, another thing on that. Uh, I wonder how many of you have the English kind of meaning of idols, people that you really look up to uh, uh, and respect uh, and would love to meet, like famous people, well-known people, renowned people, uh, tell me afterwards in the, in the Q&A if there is anyone like this that you've ever met. I would never really want to meet most of the people that I really, exp uh, really kind of look up to because I'd be afraid I would make a fool of myself. Like I used to, the Queen is now sadly passed and we have a king. Uh, I used to love the Queen and uh, Gillian would be like, oh man, wouldn't you just love to meet the Queen? And I'd say, no, I'd never, I never want to meet the Queen because I know the second I meet her, I'm going to say something stupid. I'll be so nervous, and then I'll just come away feeling kind of insignificant because she's so amazing and she speaks to a thousand people a day and doesn't remember me, but that's the most important thing that's ever happened to me in my life. Like, that's, that's not a good way to feel about yourself. It's different here, isn't it? They, they would see Christ. They would see him because he is approachable, if you like. They come for him. They do come for a mediator. That's, that's true, but he's not like that, is he? You come to Christ you're not going to feel stupid. You're not going to say the wrong thing. You're not going to leave feeling bad about yourself. Just a little point there. We would see Christ. It's, worth it. it's just such a simple phrase, but uh, one worth dwelling on and thinking about throughout the week. But uh, Jesus actually doesn't really directly answer them, which is kind of interesting. Some commentators have tried to kind of think about how his answer is in uh, kind of direct uh, directly addressing concerns that Greek philosophy has, uh, it, maybe, maybe not, but it basically doesn't really answer um, the Greeks, and we never hear from them again. But what he does say is very interesting. He says, now is the time for the Son of Man to be glorified. He's previously kind of indicated that this time would come. <laughs> there is an hour that he's waiting for, but it's not yet. Back in the wedding at Cana, his first sign uh, in John 2, 4, he says, doesn't he? He says, my hour, my hour has not come yet. He's kind of reluctant to perform the sign because the hour has not come. And then again, two more times uh, in chapter 7, 30 and chapter 8, 20, the people are unable to arrest him because his hour hasn't come yet. But now it's here. It's here, the hour of his glorification. What, what is his glorification? Well, he's gonna, it goes on to kind of explain. It's his death and resurrection. It's his passion, death, and resurrection. It's sort of like a whole package of glorification, if you like. Because he's going to be lifted up, as he said to Nicodemus, you know, just as the snake is lifted up in the desert, so will the Son of Man be lifted up. But lifted up on a cross, isn't it? Like we said earlier, this isn't a lifting up, an exaltation onto a throne. This is a lifting up in death. And we have this wonderful metaphor. This is a great, great kind of metaphor that Jesus uses of this principle. Unless a grain, falls, uh, a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He's kind of saying that his death is a necessity. This is why he come, so that there would be fruit. This is the kind of principle, is that only through death is there life. Life comes through death, and it, through death Jesus can uh, give us eternal life. That's the theme of John, isn't it? The gift of eternal life comes through death. 
And it's a counterintuitive uh, principle, isn't it, that uh, glorification comes through death, the way up is down. Exaltation comes through humiliation. Joy comes through suffering. You can't have one without the other, if you like. Think of this uh, wonderful, the wonderful kind of Christ poem in Philippians 2. This is definitely worth thinking about reading. Read this again when you get home. It says, though he was in, this is talking about Jesus, though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking a form of a servant. We're going to see just a kind of Jesus' servant heart in the next couple of chapters. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed him, bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. See that therefore there is because of the death on a cross. Therefore God he highly exalts him and bestows on him the name above every name. And it's made clear for us, isn't it, that if that's the pattern for Jesus, that's the pattern for all Christian life. Whoever loses his life, Jesus says, whoever loses his life, sorry, whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. It's kind of a description of the uh, Christian life right there. And the kind of the usual thing to do, if you hear this verse preached or you hear it taught, the usual thing to do is to kind of add a caveat in explanation there and say something like, hate, you know, hate is kind of in comparison to how much you love Christ or something. Hate your life uh, and try and kind of dull the impact of that. But I'm not going to do that, although I sort of slightly just have, but I'm not going to do that because the rhetorical force of what Jesus says is that there is no caveat. He simply says, if you love your life, you will lose it. If you hate your life, you will gain eternal life. So that's something to just let it sit with us, let it hang for a little bit, get the full rhetorical uh, point of what Jesus is saying there, and ask ourselves, do we hate our lives? Or are we actually rather comfortable? Do we want the exaltation without the humiliation? Do we want the glorification without the humility and the personal deaths and suffering that are the pattern of Christian life? Would Jesus' return, this is a good question to consider, would Jesus' return actually put a bit of a damper on our plans? Because we're pretty much content with here and now and what we have going on. No, we're to hate our life. We are to hate our life. Apart from Jesus, life is pointless and ultimately not worth living because it is no life at all. Jesus came to give life and life to its fullest, eternal life. We should be completely willing to lose our life, to suffer any loss as long as we get Jesus at the end of it. Nothing in this life matters as much as you think it does. Like Paul says, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ, Jesus my Lord, or to live is Christ. Nothing matters as much as you think it does. See, the Christian life is one of continual death to self, isn't it? Putting to death the deeds of the flesh, crucifying the old man, all those things, the sinful nature. Jesus sets the pattern. He says, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. Where I am, there my servant will be. A servant is not higher than his master, is it? We should expect to be opposed or persecuted or suffer wrong or to be mistreated, falsely accused, to be taken advantage of, to lose our lives. But what do we get in return at the end of verse 26, at the end of our passage? 
says, Jesus says, if anyone serves me, the Father will honour him. That's what we get, isn't it? Just like Jesus knew that through his death he would be glorified with the glory he had before, with the Father, the glory he had from the beginning. He endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. He sees what's ahead. We see what lies ahead. We have a living hope. And we're going to hear about this in the sermon. We have a living hope of an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you. That's the hope and the joy that we have ahead of us so that we can also go through our suffering with that in mind. So maybe a silly, trite example, but if you had £10 and you knew that you were about to inherit £10 billion or dollars, you wouldn't care if somebody took that £10, whether they asked for it or whether they stole it. It's yours to just give up or give away because the thing that you get in, in return or you get in the future is so far greater. We can endure anything and we should have such a light attitude towards the things of this life because we know that in the end we will ret- earn the reward of a welcome, a well done good and faithful servant. If anyone serves me, the Father will honour him. So I think we'll leave it on that uh, last point. Does anyone have any questions or comments on those things? There's a lot of stuff in there.